So, uh, welcome. I'm very happy um, you're all here at the campus party. So, who's from, uh, who's from Europe here? Actually, uh, almost everyone. Where are you from? All right, all right. Well, super interesting. Very, uh, I think this is a super cool event. Of course, first time in the Netherlands, but uh, internationally already uh, organized many times. So it's my pleasure to share some of my own experiences in enter entrepreneurship. And please, if you have questions or specific questions, please just raise your hand. Otherwise, it's probably going to get a bit boring. All right. So just to briefly introduce myself, who am I? Well, I ask that question all the time, of course. Um, but I'm compared to most students, a bit older. I'm a proud mom. I'm Dutch entrepreneur and an investor, and especially also to be an investor, I love it. Um, why? Because I can share my experiences as an entrepreneur, um, all the good things, but also the bad things and bad choices I made uh, to other entrepreneurs. And all well, my hobbies, probably not that interesting, uh, but I like some sea rowing, rowing at sea, some skiing, some biking, stuff like that, to make it a bit more personal. So, how did I start as an entrepreneur? To give you a brief insight, some background. Um, I come from an entrepreneurial family, and that means at home, at the kitchen table, many times uh, business was discussed, and I never actually thought it was an issue. I always kind of enjoyed it and tried to join the conversation. And when I was, I think, about 14, 15 years old, I started to do small businesses, small trading businesses. So I sold small alarms, I sold uh, uh, sunglasses, stuff like that. Just to, for the game of it, not necessarily to make a lot of money, but just to, to think um, it's a nice hobby, actually, to, uh, uh, to get involved with. So then I enjoyed the online industry in 1997. And I'm not sure how old you are, are but uh, that was the time of the dot-com hype. And the hype, that was the time that you would pay at least 100k euro for a website. Nowadays, it's, of course, insane. And, well, probably 30 to 40 percent of uh, the people, at least in the Netherlands, uh, were online. So the internet penetration was super low back in these days. Um, so I kind of envy you guys, if you want to start your own business, if you want to become an entrepreneur, uh, with the whole ecosystem that is now out there. It's a red carpet treatment for startups. I think it's a great thing. Um, and, well, if you have ideas, really you should join all these benefits that, uh, that are out there now. So I started in the online agency world in 1997. Uh, worked at a digital agency, one of the first ones in the Netherlands. And then something happened because er and 90s, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the dot-com crash took place. So at first, I was working in the, in the coolest industry in the dot-com hype, the internet industry. And then a few years later, we were doomed completely. It's hard to imagine today, uh, but it was true. So uh, nobody, uh, there were no jobs in the online industry. Uh, there were no investors. Uh, there were, uh, the, the sentiment was extremely negative. So that was a bit interesting for us because first we worked in the hottest, in hottest industry around there and then we were actually uh, out, almost outcast. Um, and why? Because back in the days, everyone thought it was very cool not to make any profits. I think that's where it all went wrong. And, uh, well, today we know it's quite smart to, um, to have a positive uh, result, but back then the times were really different. Um, nevertheless, in the middle of this dot-com crisis, we decided to start our own company. Together with some old colleagues, we decided to start DQ&A. And DQ&A stands for Digital Questions and Answers. It was just a name that was actually available, so that's why um, we choose it. And we started and it was hard because we thought, well, you know, it, it's the middle of the crisis, uh, it cannot become any harder. Uh, but that was not true because the one, two, three clients that we got, they went bankrupt, 
and we actually had to get rid of our water machine. Uh, it was tough times. Nevertheless, we thought the online industry is the future. And it's, of course, easy thing to say, but if you're surrounded nowadays, but if you're surrounded back then by all these very negative uh, sentiments and all these negative of people who are very negative about this industry and the future of online, um, I think it was great that we were strong believers in the future of digital. So we just decided to continue. And in two years' time, we got our first customer, a really, well, big customer, international customer. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. And then we knew um, that, as my father said, if it was easy, everyone would do it. And I think that's very true. And when it's complex and it's challenging, then you can make a difference. And we try to, to make that difference by proceeding and by not giving up. And um, well, that leads us today. Let me show you because to DQNA uh, Media Group, we just merged. And today we are a company of, uh, well, in 13 countries, around 400 employees. And, um, and still, if I look back today, it's, it's cool that it worked out this way because for the same, we were very close not making it. And that's, I think, uh, to, to be optimistic and to be enthusiastic, I think that always brings you further than um, uh, being less positive. So what we also did in 2007, together with a few uh, other entrepreneurs from the online industry, I decided to start P Capital. And why? Well, we had so much experience. And although we just were founded six years uh, before, we already made lots of mistakes. We, uh, we knew we could do things better, and we thought it was a great way of giving back, but also in building our own portfolio uh, by starting Peak Capital and investing in companies that were early stage internet companies. So that means uh, a proven business model, you know, not great revenues, but at least some revenue. Um, and typically we would invest around 300 to 400,000 euro in that company and try to, uh, to make it bigger and to help them, help them grow. And P Capital today, we have our third fund. Uh, we found it last year and we have around 10 participations, investments right now. I'm not sure, did anyone see Katowiki uh, here this week? Does anyone know Katowiki? You did, Marco? Well, that's one of our investments. Um, so, which is of, uh, obviously a great one because it's extremely successful. We also have uh, less successful uh, investments, of course. Um, so that is P Capital. So if you have questions later on about investments, please ask me because I really enjoy that part. These are some of our investments. Uh, the Dutch people might recognize Eens, Katowiki, and some others. Um, and typically, for you to understand, and I'm not talking here about investments a lot, but just to point out, is that if you have a portfolio of inv investments, um, out of 10, normally one or two are your fund returners. So they are the stars of your portfolio. Um, probably two or three will go bankrupt. And of course, you don't have a clue who it will be, otherwise you would not have invested in them because you think the team is good, that everything uh, and the business model suits. Um, and a few, you know, the rest, they will do okay, probably. They will not go bankrupt, but they will not be the, um, the high flyers of your uh, portfolio. And it's an interesting bet to see which ones, which ones that will be. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we grew the company, because that's why you are here. Um, although I prefer also to talk about what went wrong in these years, because that's what you learn most from, I guess. Uh, so if you have questions also from this perspective, please don't hesitate to ask me. Um, yes. Yeah, no, please. Yeah. Yeah, so the question here is, um, how do you choose and select a company to invest in and whatnot? I also get back later, but um, 
that's ba mainly a few things. Of course, the team. It's an open door, but it's, it's team, team, team. So is it a founding team? Preferably uh, with two founders. And preferably a CTO, CEO. Um, the most successful companies that we invest in do have a CTO and a CEO as a uh, founding team. Um, furthermore, um, is it a scalable business? So typically services, obviously, that I'm in with the Kino Media Group, is not extremely scalable. Um, technology, of course, is very scalable. Um, execution power. So many entrepreneurs have great ideas, great ideas. And um, the thing is, they're not always very successful in um, translating these ideas into concrete actions. So plans are being made, and of course, paper is extremely patient. Uh, but the question is, how are you going to do it, and how, how you, in, in real life, are um, the problem that you're solving, how are you going to translate that into a business? And you need the best people that you can find to get there. So is there a big enough market for the proposition? That's a super important question because maybe you have a, a great problem that you solve, but the market is extremely small, then the investor would not typically, of course, be interested to invest. Um, these are a few of the things we look at, but and I think it's super important to have a click, a personal relationship, a click. The best plans typically we get through our network, uh, via via, through people we know, um, because they have good experience with these guys or whatsoever. So that's why I strongly recommend you to go out there and network, especially technical people don't usually are very comfortable with networking and go out there. And But if you don't have a LinkedIn profile yet, please uh, create one today or now, uh, because this is your gateway um, uh, for, for your connections. I'm still today use LinkedIn all the time. I have one screen, I have two screens in my office, and one screen is always open with LinkedIn. If I want to get in, in a company for business reasons, or I want to see um, uh, for the potential talent that we uh, are trying to get in the company, I uh, just easy to see who knows who and who I can give a call to get in or to, to get more background on this, uh, typical of this particular talent. So to get back to growth of the DQR Media Group, hopefully this answers your question. Um, and to get back to the growth of the DQR Media Group, so how did we do this? After a few years, like I just told you, the first years were terrible. We couldn't find any customers. The, the economy was down. Um, it was a dot-com crisis. And then we had our big breakthrough with uh, MSN. I'm not sure if you all know MSN. Uh, of course, in Brazil it's still big, but I think it's the only country that it's still existing. Um, of course, it's Microsoft. So it was the chat engine of Microsoft. And they needed a campaign management company. So back in the day, we were managing campaigns uh, for advertisers and publishers, and that's what we did for them. And MSN was like Facebook today. It grew extremely fast. And um, you can also see that companies that were so big back then don't exist anymore, hardly exist. So it's also interesting to see uh, that the hottest companies today don't necessarily mean to be out there still uh, tomorrow, or at least in a few years' time. So um, what happened, they asked us to grow with them, which was the best thing that could happen to us. It was, on a way, in a way, a lucky shot, but at the same time, uh, we had hard time for a few years, so we could really need that breakthrough. And before we knew, we were uh, three out of four weeks uh, traveling and, and on our way in airplanes opening offices as MSN was growing so fast and they chose us to be their outsourced partner. So in um, a few years time, we were like 120, 130 people, um, not necessarily knowing how to manage these people, by the way, because we didn't have any experience. And as you know, um, well, probably you have experience by now that 
having staff is, is and, and managing a company is quite challenging because people are, of course, demanding. You need to have a clear strategy, good HR in place. Well, I tell you, we didn't have that in place. But we had a great young team, and everybody was extremely enthusiastic. So we opened our offices in Sao Paulo, in Sweden, in Spain, in Germany, in US, and all in a few years' time. Um, those were actually great years. Yeah, we made a good profit. Um, we learned all our entrepreneur lessons, I think, in those few years. Um, but that was important part and an uh, important element of our growth. And another one, of course, is organic growth. Um, if you have the right talent and the right team in place, and I would recommend you to, if you start to become an entrepreneur, be extremely picky in who you choose to work with and who you don't. Be and if you have just the slightest doubt that this person doesn't fit your culture or expertise, don't do it. And it's hard because you're a lot of times, as we were, under pressure. So you are in a hurry because your, your clients are demanding your services. And so it's, it's very tempting to, to get people in that don't 100% match your profile. And why are companies like Facebook, Google so huge and so extremely successful? Because they have a very high uh, hiring bar, right? So it's hard to get in. Um, they do multiple interviews across layers, management layers. And, um, and if you don't have these analytical or strategic skills, you just don't get in. And I think it's a great thing uh, because that's the only way you can build your company fast. Of course, we made many mistakes in this field, many mistakes, because we were under pressure and we, we thought this friend of this friend was a great guy, so please come in and help us out. But at the end of the day, it was a lot of uh, mess we had to clean up. And if we had to, if we choose the right person straight away, I think we would have done a way better job in a way shorter time frame. So talent, don't underestimate it. I think we did that for a long time. Uh, I'm glad now we have an HR uh, department of four people. Um, and most of the time they're busy in talent, uh, talent recruitment. How another way of growing your company is by acquisitions, M&A, merger and acquisitions, a typical way of, of calling this. And I love that. And why? It's, it's in the nature of peak capital. It's deal making. And if you have a certain expertise that you're lacking in the company, or as Facebook does it all the time, or Google, they, have, they do uh, talent acquisitions, uh, you buy a company uh, because you cannot find that talent. It's hard to get a team in. Or uh, it's a specific product or service that you want to move into because the industry is moving that way, but you don't necessarily have the abilities yourself. And it's extremely hard to get that talent in. So we did three acquisitions uh, in the last five to six years. And um, one wasn't that successful, but it was, I think, a very wrong choice we made to, to enter the Swiss market. Are there any people from Switzerland here? No? Good thing. Um, because um, Swiss tend to be quite, um, well, uh, doing their own thing, um, not very fond of change, and not very adaptive to change. So I think, uh, and it's a small market, and, and the, 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 the salaries are extremely high. So I think that was, uh, well, a bit unfortunate. But of course, we learned from that. We had two very successful acquisitions. Uh, one affiliate company and uh, one trafficking company, and those are very well integrated now. And that means you can make a big step in terms of uh, talented staff to join your company, but at the same time you buy, of course, also revenues and uh, preferably uh, also profitability. And so you can make big steps. At the same time, you have to integrate these companies. That takes time. Um, but uh, what we did was a kind of a mixture of, uh, of all of these. And as I just said, we merged uh, last, actually it was December, January uh, this year. 
with a South African company. Uh, DQNA has their back offices in Cape Town. And um, this company was a client of ours in Cape Town. They are very big in search engine marketing. And we are quite big in, uh, in display marketing. And it's a great match. Why? Because um, we are together, we combine our services. And at the same time, we have different geos that we are in. So um, a merger is a huge step. So this doubles, of in, this in our case, it doubled our staff. It doubled our revenue so because we're almost equally uh, big. Does it make sense what I'm, t what I'm saying? Good, otherwise you just tell me. I'm here for you. Yes, please. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what's the difference actually acquisition and merger? Acquisition, you buy indeed the whole company and um, you can choose to keep the brand alive. That's what we did for two of them. Um, and a merger is that you really um, bring two companies together on an equal base. So 50, so you bring in the whole company, both of you, and then 50 and 50% 50 makes uh, 100. Um, so, uh, and a merger now, we are in the midst of uh, defining our new strategy. We are in the midst of uh, branding. Hey, whose brand are we uh, will be leading? I'm glad we already uh, took the step of um, uh, who's leading the company and how the management team should look like, because that's always an interesting challenge when you merge. Um, does that answer your question? No. Yeah. Yes, but they stay in the company, usually. You see, so new management stays in the company because that's an important reason to acquire that company. And, and, and most of the time you will have a kind of uh, earn out. Uh, so that means that you, you are paid, as the, uh, the company that sells are, is paid on a yearly base. So they stay in the company for a few more years, so they don't run well. That, that's the whole idea. Um, what are some challenges and learnings from these 15 years of entrepreneurship? Um, many, but a few I would like to share with you. Um, what you will see in Europe, I'm always quite jealous of the, of, of the US, United States of America. Um, Europe is not united. We all know, actually, we try to, uh, to, to make it work in a political sense and so forth, but Looking from a business perspective, you have to do business with a whole lot of countries if you want to expand. And it's quite complicated. Why? Because we as Dutch, or you as a Spanish, or, or whatever you, wherever you're from, uh, you will find out very soon that we differ alike. We differ a lot, which is the great thing, but also a challenge from a business perspective. Um, and uh, culturally, it's, I think it's only, it, it interests me uh, a lot. But if you look from a, for example, tax perspective, if you look from an, um, uh, an, an human resources perspective, and all the labor law differences in all these countries, it's a headache. It's a headache. It costed us a lot of money. And with the P we t PWCs and the like, um, to, to ask them for advice how we should manage our tax and, uh, and labor um, issues that we had. And I think it's a shame, but I know they're working on it, but that we still lack an international or an internal European market. It would make business for all of us so much easier. Um, but that's more of a... Um, um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can solve, that politics can uh, solve that quickly. We always talk to the politicians to get it on the agenda. Again, one that we heard before is the execution of strategy. So who in this room is planning on starting his own company? A few of you, good. Uh, do already have there, some people have their own company? Okay, great. Um, well, then probably have experienced that a strategy is, is one, yeah, but to execute on that strategy is, uh, can be challenging. Do you recognize that or not? Sure. Well, that's, uh, I'm glad. 
Um, but um, so you need the right hands and the right people to execute on that strategy. It seems easy, but it's, I think, pretty complicated. Focus. We tend to say hocus pocus focus. And why? Um, along the way, a lot of opportunities will pop up if you start your company. And partnerships and resellerships and people who want to do business with you. And um, at least that's what we experienced. And what did, what did we do? We just talked to everyone. Uh, because we didn't have a clue and we thought, well, maybe it's a good opportunity. Let's do it. Very opportunistic. And I think that's very healthy. But at the end of the day, it was distracting us so much. And the, 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 the bigger we grew, the more we were distracted and the more people want to do business with you. Uh, that, uh, that is not 100% related to our strategy. So we decided on a certain moment, we kind of realized, like, listen, this, cost, this is costing us a lot of time, but you feel flattered that people want to talk to you and you see opportunities because you're a very optimistic business person. Um, but focus, so saying no and say, listen, I don't have time for this. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I need time to work. I, you know, maybe in a few years, for the next year or six months, let's be back in touch. Um, that's what we started to do, and I think that was one of the best things we did. And because by focusing and, 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 and kind of cut out all the noise, we were able to grow the company better. Um, and here it is again, team. I'm not sure, do you have co-founders in your team? Do you have co-founders? Okay. Um, I would highly recommend for the people who want to start their own company and, and don't didn't start yet, don't do this alone. Um, why? Because you will face challenging times. Uh, entrepreneurship is a great ride. It's a huge adventure, uh, but nobody tells you too much about all the hard times as well. That you have to fire this person who you know has a family and you know this family um, but anyhow, the, uh, there are a few reasons why you have to fire this person and you can't sleep and you have stomach problems and, and, and pain because you have to do this. Um, you have to, to, to um, sleep many sleepless nights because of the decisions you have to make. The financing that doesn't come in in time. Um, all kinds of challenges that you will face. And if you have to go through that all by yourself, I think it's very hard. So my business partner and me, uh, we broke up, so to say, I think after six years, seven years, and it felt like a divorce. Um, we just had different visions on how to proceed. That's just natural. It came down also, I think, to our characteristics and um, the persons we were. Um, but it was, it was hard because on a certain time, you find yourself making these decisions alone. And I decided I don't like this. I want to celebrate success together, but I also would want to share the hard times together because that makes it more easy to cope with and to deal with and to, to, to challenge each other. So I found a new founder. So don't worry if you make a bad choice. There's always a second round. Um, but preferably, of course, um, you stick with your uh, original founding partner. Uh, but this guy that I got in, he's now also our CEO, uh, was the perfect person for that moment in time. A real manager with a, with a, with a very clear strategy. And I'm very lucky, I feel, to, uh, to do business already together for around six years. So team, team, team. You know, you can never be too ambitious. And it was one of my very hard lessons learned. Um, also, one of the other um, issues is on a certain moment, yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't see you. Yeah. Disadvantages. The question is what are the disadvantages of having a co founder? Um, of course, it's not only your own show. So. Um, you have certain qualities, your co-founder has certain qualities, 
but unfortunately, both sides will have some blind spots about these qualities, right? Um, so uh, if you can be open to each other and talk uh, openly and share your concerns and also uh, give feedback on each other's performance, I think that's a great thing. We were not so good in that, I'd, I'll be honest. I'm, I grew uh, from that perspective. Um, so things were never discussed so openly because we were quite sensitive to, uh, we were actually afraid that we would take it personal. Um, and that's a mistake because it's a, from a business perspective. Uh, you all like each other, so otherwise you would not have started to build the company together. Um, of course, uh, so you share the risk, but you also share your upside together. You I, d I don't really I think that's a huge disadvantage, but uh, some, some founders that I know that started uh, alone, and they just want to go for the success by themselves, claim that success. Um, and of course, it's hard when, like I experienced in um, 2007, 2008, that visions are um, are changing and that you're not aligned anymore, um, which is a natural thing because you grow in all these years of entrepreneurship and um, you become a different person after all these years and experiences. And for us, it, it was hard. We did it, I think, with mutual respect, um, but that's the disadvantage. It's the same as being single or being married. If you divorce, yeah, you take the pain yeah, but you also take the upside of all the good years you have together. So I honestly cannot think of so many disadvantages as much as the advantages there are. And, uh, but and also you stay challenged. So you challenge each other by, are we, is this the right decision? Is this the right person to hire? Is this the, ni is this the right investor to work with? And it's easier to make decisions together than uh, all by yourself, Im from my personal experience but it should also match your personality, of course. But stay challenged. So on a certain moment, we were uh, facing success. After hard years, we just grew, like I just told you, we, we grew in a very short time period. We were very, very successful and healthy company. And people start to get interest. The press starts to get show interest. Um, well, you you, you get the feeling that, well, well, after all these years, it's working. And I think the biggest challenge is then to stay with your both feet on the ground and surround yourself by people who stay, uh, who challenge you. And we came up with a board of advisors. I also took a coach myself. I think personal development is something that never stops. And I, I invest quite some time and, and money in, in coaches or in a coach and uh, a training here and there because you're never, there's always more to learn. And I think if you stop doing this or, or stop um, um, taking some reflections or so, yeah, that's probably uh, not a good sign. I think guys like Zuckerberg or whoever also still uh, and, and Sheryl Sandberg uh, do this. So, um, board of advisors, you guys already have your own company. I'm not sure if you do have an advisory board, uh, but otherwise I would highly recommend you to, uh, to start one. Uh, why? Because, and, and be also very ambitious in the range of people you would like to see connected to your company. Just aim for the moon and just go for the, the hot shots in your industry because there's always um, no for an answer. You, if you don't try, you will never know. And they can help you opening doors. So we had some quite um, high-end advisors surrounding us. And they just did it for fun because they, they like to help young entrepreneurs. I help young entrepreneurs myself all the time because I needed that break when I, was, uh, I just started. Um, so be ambitious and get this board of advisors out there. And don't be embarrassed, yes. Yeah, it's however you would like to do it. I, I'm also now in boards that are just come together once a year. Some boards come together twice a year. Uh, people are usually quite busy who you want to ask in your board, right? So, uh, but I also have uh, boards, uh, advisory boards that uh, just call you, that the entrepreneur just calls you every now and then and we don't come physically together at all. 
Um, and uh, don't make it a legal thing because people want to uh, don't want to have restrictions or whatsoever. Just informal, and you can always organize a dinner or so each year, and then they get they can then decide to come or not. But usually, these type of people you want to get in are quite busy busy guys. Um, yeah. Quite soon, actually just after you start, or even before. I would do that, yeah. Why? Because they, um, they can open up a whole new network for you. Uh, they might even want to invest in your company because they understand your business, and if, at least if they think it's a good idea, right? Um, and... Um, uh, and, and, and usually, the other way around, they learn from you as much as you learn from them, right? Because it's entrepreneurship changed quite a bit, I would say, in the last years. So, um, and don't be shy. I think it's very important not to be shy. And, um, and LinkedIn, again, is a great source. Who knows who and who can call this person for me to see if he wants to do this? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what kind of, how do you, um, uh, have, is there an incentive for the advisory board members? I think it's a good question. Um, you can choose for any option you like. Um, uh, one of the advisory boards I was in um, was an international company in analytics of uh, uh, mobile analytics. And um, these guys gave us some options on shares, which is great because they exited in six months, but we never, of course, uh, had foreseen. Um, but most of the time, you don't pay a board member just because of they like it, they, they like you as a person, or they think you're, what you're doing, you're disrupting an industry they are in, that they think that's interesting. Um, you have a, a personal match, of course, or you're in one of the accelerator programs, a lot of mentors. Um, so, of course, you can be generous and share some options or whatsoever. They don't have any value anyway in the beginning, so it's easy to give uh, to give these away. Um, but make it uh, they 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 are in for the energy and for the learnings. I would say, um, a coach. I just um, and a mentor, or nowadays it's called more mentor. A mentor or a coach. You pick someone that you highly respect. And um, well, this is what start of boot camps and, and, and of course the rock stars and all these international accelerators that you n are aware of. Uh, they, uh, I'm also a mentor at some of these programs. There are many mentors. And why, uh, why do these programs have all these mentors? Because they make these startups better. And they are um, looking for an opportunity to invest, many mentors. And of course, there's no better way to get a grip or a sense of this company uh, while well you have uh, had a few meetings and you see this company and, and the entrepreneur, how they evolve. So um, get I would really hi highly recommend you to get a coach or a mentor. Um, and again, be picky. Um, you can always go to the fifth or sixth option of your list, but why not start at the first? Of course, it will be maybe hard to get, um, uh, to get Zuckerberg in, but uh, probably uh, some, some local... Uh, well, uh, management of of uh, companies that you really admire, uh, you definitely can get in. You just don't, you know, just don't be shy again. And use your charms and your enthusiasm because that's what people are really looking for. I would say. Um, I would like to jump a little bit into the investors part, if that's okay for you. If not, then uh, just uh, let me know. So, if you go for funding. Uh, what do investors look at? So what do companies like us, like P Capital, we are, by the way, focused only on Dutch um, uh, companies as we are co-funded by the government, which is a great uh, thing the Dutch government does, I have to admit. Um, of course, I just told you already, team, team, team. Team. So the first impression is you shake hands with someone, and please, it's funny, but please give a firm hand. That's sometimes all right, not... Um, uh, well, that's part of the whole um, getting to know each other uh, parade. And um, 
and make sure you present yourself in the best possible way. And of course, if there's a, uh, a co-founding team, we are even more enthusiastic. And be a problem solver. Probably you heard that before already this week. The biggest successful companies, they solve a problem. And not a small problem, but a big problem. And um, I think there's still a lot of industries that are ready to be disrupted. For example, I was just, uh, I needed a rental car last week. And service you get is really horrible. And you don't have any choice. You're lucky if you get a car that you, uh, that you booked for. Uh, but there's so many other industries that are ready to be disrupted. And I guess that's why you, some of you are starting your own company. Look at the market potential. Again, if it's a small problem you solve, it's nice, it can be a hobby project, that it, you know, you can be happy, um, but why not go for a bigger market? And execution power, I will not repeat myself, but you know what I mean, and scalability. I would never ever start a company again like I did 15 years ago. Because it's services, and services are great, and they're profitable and so forth, but they're not very scalable. So you need more people all the time, all the time, all the time. And preferably, of course, you want to do a lot of business and a lot of um, revenue without necessarily having to add more and more people. Look at, for example, Instagram or, or one of the, or WhatsApp, great example. Yeah, they only have a team of, well, when they were acquired by Facebook, well, who knows, 100, 150 people max. And they did, uh, well, the volumes were out of this world and they still have to start seriously monetizing it. And that's what I call scalable companies. And investors love scalable companies. They, will, they were not really willing, I think, to talk to you for uh, if, if, if your company is not scalable. Um, what else? Yeah, and how? How do you meet these investors? And how, uh, and how does that work? Well, hopefully you, you, you have you yourself, you like sales, or uh, your, your, your co-founder. Hopefully one of the two is the better salesman, or probably you're both. Uh, but my experience is that usually one of the founders, and that's probably most of the time the CTO type of guy, that they don't say a lot, and the, the more commercial CEO type of guy uh, sells, uh, sells the company. Uh, in the pitch. So um, again, don't be shy and, and sell yourself. Make sure you have a great uh, investment deck, memorandum, and, uh, and sell yourself. Smart investors will always ask you the right questions, so it's always a bit, um, well, uh, and nicely decorated, nicely uh, and nice wording. Uh, so create a pitch, a teaser. And this teaser is usually a two-pager and this two pager in this two pager you sell and you you sum up all the key ingredients of which i think mo one of the most important again is the team sometimes we receive out of this three four hundred um, uh, teasers that we receive every year for p capital um, there's not one line on the team which i cannot understand because this is the most important part of the whole company of the whole business so who are you going to hire next because you're fundraising and because you're fundraising it means that you have big plans you need this money to build your company so my question is always okay with all this money on the bank later on what's your plan who are you going to hire next do you have a list of all these talents that you would like to get in your company? Or is it still blur and you don't have a clue? Are you well enough engaged with the market so that you know how to find these people? Or do you need a executive search company, which I'm not in favor of, to get these guys in? Be prepared for these type of questions. What is the plan when you get all this money in? And of course, 
investors love to understand who to exit your company to. Us typically, we are in for the longer term in the sense five to seven years, I would say. That's our horizon. Some investors have a very short horizon. They think three years, <laughs> and just sell the company or exit it or whatsoever. Um, we are not necessarily, I think, in such a hurry. Um, another advantage of having uh, the government on board. But um, always have a concrete idea of who your exit partners will be. Is it uh, IBM or is it, is it uh, whatever, one of the other industry leaders in your, um, uh, in your field? And just have a clear picture because this question you can definitely expect when you talk to investors. Advisory board, here he is again. And what I would, yes. Well, uh, the question is exit partners. Do you need concrete names? Preferably investors like that because then they can, they have a concrete understanding. Um, but if they understand your business case and what you're doing and trying to solve, which problem you're trying to solve, I don't think it's necessary. But if they don't get that, they usually uh, would like to see some names so can do they can do their research. Yeah, exactly. And PR and social media is, of course, extremely important. When we started, th there was no such thing as social media. Um, it's incredible. Uh, but nowadays, you can so easily claim authority. So start your own blog on, on, on the field that you are, uh, hey, your, your company is in. Or even if you're just now a student and you don't have the plan yet to start your company, why not start a blog or be an, an, an opinion leader in your field of expertise or your field of interest? So I would hi highly recommend you to start doing this so when you take your next step uh, in your field of interest, uh, people know who you are and you can easily um, build out your network because you follow certain blogs, I'm sure. And why shouldn't people follow you? Because you have lots of smart things to share. And um, again, don't be shy. It's hard sometimes, but don't be shy. Um, and then I think I have one more, yes, network. Who likes to network? Oh, that's good, that's good. I love to network myself. Uh, that's why I was always in sales, I'm afraid. But, um, uh, but network is super important. We are not fortunate to live in Silicon Valley yet, probably. Silicon Valley has a very easy ecosystem. Uh, hey, all professors know all the investors and all the investors know it's very easy to get in touch. It's, 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 it's really um, one of a kind, I would say. And, but also here we have in Europe, or let's, let's bring it back to the Netherlands, it's a small network. It's, it's, it's quite easy to understand who is who and, uh, and, and how to enter these networks. So I would say go out there and be visible, make sure that people know who you are. Um, and that's how it works for us, for P Capital, also for DQ&A. We just go out there and make sure that people remember us and know who we are. Um, and of course, one day, I would love for you guys to be one of these new stars and that we can put your picture and frame them and use them in some future presentations because you have a lot of skills and I think you guys are super talented to uh, to make the difference so thank you very much if you have more questions let me know I'm here and uh, hopefully for the ones who are have their own company already make sure it's going to be huge success if not this one then the next for the ones who are trying to start or going to start a company go for it and uh, for the ones who, uh, who don't have the ambition, it's nothing wrong with um, getting some expertise at a corporate company for the first years and then probably later start your own company. So thank you very much. Have a great um, campus party. Bye-bye.